everyone. Welcome to Cruise Operations Center. In this introductory session today, we're going to talk about getting started with the application and a simple portlet that we use to help you get started quickly. On the home page, as soon as you log in, you're going to come across this portlet called Getting Started. These 12 steps identify some basic items that you need to configure to have your system up and running quickly uh, for most of the major applications. First one here is Support Assist. Click on the Edit action here. You're provided with a EULA uh, that basically describes that some, some information related to the way the Support Assist is invoked. And you're basically allowing, based on this end user agreement, you're allowing uh, this software to configure devices to send Support Assist data up to Dell. You're simply opting in or opting out. If you don't want this data sent from your network, say opt out. If you want it on or occasionally on, you can select opt in. And when you select opt-in, you're provided some other options here for various things uh, in terms of how you want the support assist to be invoked. Enable support assist on existing switches. If you've already discovered, you can check that and it will, uh, once it's applied, you will automatically go out and configure those switches to send that support assist data. Or you can do um, enable support assist on new switches at discovery time. Now, if you do that, as soon as you discover, an action will be sent to devices to uh, configure them for support assist data. You can do both or you can do neither. If you do neither, uh, you're basically opting into the EULA that it, basically saying that when you do need this functionality, it's okay to do. Now, part of this is doing the contact information. So you will need to apply your contact information um, relative to your system here. And this can just be done one time. And uh, this, will, this will accompany that information that we configure on the device in terms of configuring that that particular uh, feature. We click apply uh, your configuration here and you'll be done with that particular option. So just say apply and or cancel and uh, it will say setup is required or recommended uh, or complete depending on uh, the status of where you're at there. The next item uh, also related to Dell specific equipment is your uh, Dell EMC warranty reporting. I can click the edit tab this is also an item that you need to opt in or opt out of. You're basically agreeing that devices, uh, we can correlate the service tag of your devices to a Dell API, or basically a database at Dell, and allowing us to correlate the service tag with your warranty information. You opt in or opt out, and if you're using a proxy server, click the proxy server button and uh, configure your settings. Uh, what will happen is at periodic intervals, we will alert you when those warranties are coming close to expiration. The next item is SMTP configuration. If you intend to use email uh, for forwarding of alerts, manual emailing, automation rules that use email, uh, you will need to set up an outgoing mail server. You would click the edit button and enter the values here that correspond to your outgoing server. Here's an example. It could be smtp.gmail.com. It could be an internal um, address to your internal corporate email, but it does need to be a valid outgoing mail server in your environment or accessible in your environment. Enter the port that's applicable for that those settings in that mail server. If authentication is being used, simply check the authentication enabled and then provide the username password that's required and then the security protocol that you're using. You'll also need to add a return address uh, for your outgoing server. Um, this will show up on the outgoing email. You can optionally put in default subject for the uh, email subject. Uh, connection timeout send out uh, send timeout and max per minute can be ignored for the purposes of this initial setup uh, they're generally these default settings are fine uh, once you have successfully entered the correct credentials uh, you can test and you will get a success notification in the upper right if you do not get a success notification most of the time it has to do with these settings on here for your mail server in your environment suggest you try an external environment for example a gmail account um, that you know you have access to um, if, if it's still failing on your internal account just to validate that the process is working and that it is just settings on your environment. Next we have file servers. Generally if you're installing the Windows package it comes with an internal file server. We do not recommend that you use that for production usage. Generally we prefer that you have your own external file server. This could be a file server running on the same server it could be a file server running on a remote server. It could be a Linux file server or a Windows file server. It doesn't really matter. Uh, but it, it, you would need one set up in your environment in order to use the external. To add an external, you come in here and say new file server. Give it a name, a description, 
click enabled here to make sure that it is working, for, it will work for you or be used in, as, a, as a file server in your environment. Uh, you, can, you can create various kinds here. First of all, we have a file server with FTP. Um, you can choose to have TFTP or not have to TFTP. These two go together. You need an FTP server with a TFTP server. So you can create one just for FTP and TFTP. You'll notice here you can't select secure access. Um, so you can only create FTP or TFTP um, in this initial instance and then put the um, IP address of your server and the login and password that you use to log into it. Now one thing to note here is that if you set up these servers, um, they do need to be pointing to the same directory. And this is important because what happens is when either the firmware image is deployed to the file server, it puts it in a specific location and then tells the device to go and get it from that location. Or conversely, on a backup, we will um, um, tell the device to put it in a specific location and then the software will go and get it from that location. So it needs to be consistently in the same directory. We save that and then if you do want to create an, a separate uh, secure server, you can simply put secure server and then you can even have the same server be a, uh, the same IP address, um, but you would just enter another entry for that and enter the IP address and the login credentials and uh, you can ignore the external IP address and net mask at this time. This is for uh, advanced situations where the device sees the file server as a different IP than the software sees the file server. So it's a little bit of a mixed case here, but um, you can ignore that safely for now, unless you have a unique environment. You can click test here and it will test your um, file server, uh, letting you know if it is successfully putting a file there and can and can then can retrieve it. You'll see here I have multiple servers set up. I have one for SCP and I have one for TFTP. Again, they don't have to be different IP addresses. They can actually be the same server serving the same function. It just depends on how you configure those. And then you also have the opportunity here to enable scheduling. So if you want to enable default backup, simply enable the default schedule and your devices will automatically be backed up at the uh, default interval, which is also stored in the uh, scheduling uh, application. You can also tur instead turn on um, change determination. In this process, the devices will be scanned periodically and only if they detect a change will they be backed up. So depending on what you need here, you can do both, you can do neither, it just depends uh, what you need here. In the next section, we have upload firmware images. Now this gives you the opportunity to import images into the system for switches that are in your environment. These could be non-Dell switches, these could be Cisco, Juniper, any, any driver that we have in the system that's supported uh, will support the ability to deploy images. We seed a lot of the Dell images out of the box, but this provides you an opportunity to import those images. Now those images can also be uploaded at a later time, so this is optional if you don't want to worry about firmware deployment right now um, for non-Dell devices or non-N series I should say. Uh, you can simply go to the upload firmware images over here on the right um, of your screen here um, or you can go over to the configuration management tab which runs across the top here and that also has a way to manually import new images. In order to import images here, click edit and provide a name. Say, For example, let's say you wanted to import a Cisco image. You provide a description if you need to and then a version um, that applies to this particular image that you intend to import and then choose the family of device that you want to import and this is basically so that the uh, image is associated to those types of devices at deployment time. So for example, Cisco IOS, uh, you may have different options for device family depending on the image here. But if, since I know I'm importing an IOS image, just select it here, go to image files and pull that uh, image off of your hard drive with select files or use the import from URL to, grab, to pull it from a URL. Once that's imported, you'll get a message here saying success, and that will then be in the image repository for you to deploy the image, which you can do from the configuration management tab. The next two sections are around discovery. So we have authentication. These are the credentials you're going to use against your devices, and then discovery profiles, which use those authentications. You can skip the authentications if you would like because you'll be able to provide those authentications or manually set those authentications in the profile. If you choose to provide the authentications or set the authentications in advance, you would click edit here and then provide the, the uh, new credentials that, that you would need here. And generally for devices you're going to need SNMP credential and you're going to need a Telnet or, or SSH credential. Those are probably the minimum that are needed for devices for login. To create a new credential you can just right click and then say right click any row and say new and you'll be given an opportunity here to add your credential name. I recommend you make it uh, meaningful so that you know what it is. Maybe it's your test SNMP. So then you would pick SNMP off of here, V1 or V2. 
and then provide the uh, values here for your read, write, and community. You really only need the read here, so you could uh, simply paste in the same value for all three here. We only re use the uh, read community uh, for general purposes. So we apply that and save it. There's your SNMP credential. Create it, create a new CLI credential. You can come in here and uh, type in uh, CLI, SSH, or whatever is meaningful to you. Pick that CLI credential. Uh, if it's different, or if you're doing a different credential, you can pick that here. But generally, there's only one for Telnet and SSH, which is generally what you need at a minimum, along with SNMP for devices. Uh, put in your user ID, your user password. Um, and if you have a privilege mode command, if it's not enabled, you can change it here, or you can put in your password here automatically. I recommend you just leave enable here if you haven't changed that. So you would apply and save that, and you would have those credentials now staged in your system ready for you to use in your discovery profiles. Incidentally, if I didn't mention it here, some of these items have a mark as complete. If you want to go through this list of items here and mark it as complete as you go through them, you'll notice here that the status will be updated, letting you know where you're at. So the next item is the discovery profile where you're actually going to discover devices or at least create the profile that allows you to discover. There's quite a good dialogue here letting you know what needs to be done here. But generally, you're going to come into the discovery profiles tab and you're going to uh, portlet and uh, click new. Call it whatever is useful to you. Sometimes it's useful to call this by the devices you're discovering. Sometimes it's by the uh, devices. Um, you could call this, you know, my Cisco's or my Dell's, uh, whatever is meaningful to you, because you, you might want to re-execute this profile later. You might want to change an IP address or an IP address range and use the same credentials or something like that. So you're going to save these uh, with a useful name. Uh, you can ignore most of these parameters down below here. Those are uh, covered in more detail in our discovery tutorial. I will skip those for now. You can leave the defaults here. Next, I would go over to the network tab. You're going to provide some some naming of your uh, devices you wanted to discover initially, either a range here, comma delimited, uh, by subnet. You can, with the drop-down list, there's other options here, but you simply type in whatever IP address or range you want to do here. Um, maybe you want to go to 1.1.1. .1 .1 .5. And then create those new credentials. This gives another opportunity to create credentials for your SNMP and CLI that you're going to need. Or you can choose existing, and this is where you can go through and choose whatever uh, um, credentials were pre previously selected. Maybe a Telnet credential. And this is the credentials you would run against these target devices above here. I do recommend you go over to the Inspection tab. You can skip actions. There's nothing there really uh, pertinent to discovery at this time. Uh, but inspection allows you to check your credentials. And so I'm just going to show you an example here. This will fail, but I wanted to give you an example here of how it works. And of course, in this example, I expected these to fail. But I wanted to point out that you can go to this little plus sign icon and expand and see the status of the, of the um, credentials that have been tried. This is important because you may even get a success, but you may have one of these that fail. Some devices only require SNMP, and while it might say discovery success, it may have not passed the uh, CLI credential, meaning you won't, have, you won't have support for backup, restore, and deployment if that has failed. So please check that even though you get a, a discovery success um, option here. So you have the opportunity now to go back to your network and then modify these credentials here. Uh, to what you need, either create new ones or update them um, as needed here. You can also have multiple SNMP, multiple CLI credentials. It will just pick the first one that works. It tries SNMP first, so I mean, we'll try that first, and if you have three or four of these, it will try them all, uh, or even Telnet or SSH, it will try whatever you have there until it finds one that works. So this will slow down your discovery if it has to try multiple credentials that are incorrect. So you can reorder those over here on the right so you, to put the most probable ones at the top here. If you want to add other things like Windows, you would uh, create new ones for uh, WMI, create a new authentication for WMI, and enter the credentials, the administrator credentials for a win Windows box. If you're using something like Linux servers, you can use WebM and enter those credentials for that box. And then there's actually one for Redfish if you're doing servers for the out-of-band management control like IDRAC or CMC, ILO, those kind of things. You can add those administrative credentials here as well to discover those types of devices. Again, you can mark setup as complete and then go back to your list. Traffic flow is an area where if you're using traffic flow, 
you want to configure devices uh, to send data to the software so that you can analyze them on the traffic flow page that we have for you. Click Edit. It's a three-step process. Select a device you want to enable for traffic flow. Just right-click, Traffic Flow Analyzer, and register it. This allows us to receive that data from that device. The second step is to do a Create Configuration. You can also remove or show the current configuration, but generally you want to create the top-level configuration on that box so that it is configured for traffic flow. The third step is the ability to uh, uh, monitor that traffic flow on specific ports. So you need to enable it at the port level as well. So select one or more ports that you want to enable traffic flow on and then right click and do traffic flow and also send the create configuration command. Once those three steps are completed, you should start receiving data and traffic flow. It takes about 20 minutes for that data to show up. These create configurations are set for the major, primary, or most used drivers. Not every driver um, has a create configuration, in which case you can set those up manually on the device to set it at the top level and at the port level, and then just point it to this software, this IP address of wherever you're installed, so that you can start seeing that data. The next item is performance monitoring. We're going to click Edit here. And out of the box, we have several monitors uh, available to you um, that we recommend you turn on. The first one is called the ICMP monitor. This is a ping monitor. That is actually on by default. The next one we ask you to turn on uh, is the default interface monitor. This one will go out and monitor uh, for a variety of metrics all of your interfaces on your switches and other devices and pull in data about bandwidth utilization, errors, packet errors, discards, all those sorts of things. And so you can edit the uh, monitor if you want to see the details of what's in that monitor, the polling interval. Uh, but you enable it and you're going to see the number of targets that are in there. And uh, over about three polling cycle cycles, uh, you should start seeing data in, on the performance tab of your, um, of your performance dashboard. The other one here is key metrics. If you want to see things like CPU memory, enable this across all your devices. If you enable this, it will span all of your devices and you'll see data for those kinds of things. The WMI monitor is one specific for Windows. If you want to see things like uh, Windows specific monitoring, uh, you can enable that as well. So just right click and say enable. If it's, if, it's enab if it's enabled, you're going to see disable. If it's disabled, you would see enable here. And just turn it on. Uh, one thing to note here is uh, as you expand your system, turning on all your monitors on all your interfaces by default has some resource impact. So if you start small and you've sized your trial program for 50 devices, 25 devices, and then all of a sudden you've, you've increased to 500 devices, your system may not be resourced properly for that number of devices for monitoring. So you may see some slowdown in the UI. So just keep that in mind as you start enabling these monitors that every interface on every device will be monitored it could potentially have a large impact. And then the last three here are simply checks for Perl installation. This is needed for some of our action scripts that are written in Perl. Uh, most platforms this is already set. Uh, you can go into the edit mode and click that to check it. You can also go into a PDF check. This allows you to get PDF reports in the screen, either from your operating system using PDF or through the browser. You can set that up either way. This just basically will check that it is enabled. And then finally, there's OME integration. If you're using Open Manage Essentials and you want to integrate to that product to pull in all the servers and get all the alerts from those devices into the software, uh, you would simply come into this and provide the credentials that are needed for that, uh, down here you'll see the IP address you will set, you will set the username and password, and then other items here you can set, you, know, you can basically check all four of these and uh, you should be good there and just click save and then you will automatically it will go out and pull that information in. Okay, I hope that was useful. Feel free to uh, visit our website at torontosoftware.com.